Hello, we are all from the Office of Food for Peace, and I'm just going to give a quick introduction of our panel before I say a little bit about what we do. But we were curious who was in the room. So do, how many of you are students? Can you just raise your hand so we have a good sense? OK, great. And who here works for, with implementing partners? OK. And academic, academic folks? Kind of, a little bit, shyly, all, all of the above. <laughs> OK, anything I missed, any broad category, I'm sure. <laughs> what was it? USAID. USAID. OK, there we go. <laughs> that, was a, that, that was a good one. All right, so we're going to talk today um, about how our office at Food for Peace uses evidence to address Food and, food and nutrition insecurity from really holistic, multi-sectoral approaches. So first, I'm going to introduce our panel, just kind of to keep things moving as we start going. So we're going to, so we're all from the technical team at Food for Peace, so we kind of work in support of our GEO colleagues and advise, um, and have kind of advisory roles from the technical side. So the first person to talk today after me is going to be Mike Mansky, who's a nutrition advisor. Um, since we have students in the room, I also wanted to stress that we all have really interdisciplinary backgrounds, and a lot of us have overlapped with public health, um, have public health experience. So just to encourage those of you in these inter, more like multi-sectoral fields, that you, we need all hands on deck in humanitarian aid and development. So. Um, just wanted to highlight that a little bit. So Mike Mansky is a nutrition advisor at Food for Peace. He's worked at USAID for over five years. He was a he has a master's in public health and came from the Global Health Bureau before Food for Peace. And he's a Peace Corps, returned Peace Corps volunteer from Guinea. Peace Corps volunteers in the room? OK. <laughs> uh, next is Nicole Van Abel. She's the senior WASH advisor at Food for Peace. Um, so WASH, the water, sanitation, and hygiene. Uh, she has a background in environmental, in environmental engineering and microbi microbiology and public health. She has a master's, master's and PhD degrees in environmental engineering and public health. And Charlie Davis is an agricultural advisor at Food for Peace. He's done a couple tours with USAID and other roles in Mali and Ukraine, and before that worked in agriculture development in several other countries. And he has a master's in agricultural development economics. And then at the end of the table there is Jenny Baca, who is a gender and youth advisor at Food for Peace. And her work is focused on the intersection of social inequality and environment. She has a PhD in human geography. And my name is Hillary Cook. I'm on the monitoring and evaluation team. My background, I have a PhD in medical sociology and race and ethnic relations. So we all come from these very inter multi-sectoral areas, which I think is really lovely. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction of what we do at Food for Peace. So those of you who are, is anyone familiar with, with the work there? Some? Yeah? OK. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be the very broad strokes of it. So Food for Peace is the world leader in emergency food assistance. That is a big bulk of our funding is for emergency food assistance. We reach more than 60. 60 million people in over 50 countries, and our mandate is to serve the most, the most vulnerable. So we work with the poorest of the poor, usually. So while a large part of our money goes into emergency programs, we also have a really strong development portfolio, which and those programs really work to address the root causes of food insecurity and kind of working from both individual and community level, community level interventions. Um, to lay the foundations for stable and inclusive growth. So these development food security activities really address the underlying causes of poverty and malnutrition and food insecurity. So we look at the, these, these programs that we fund through implementing partners, uh, work on incomes, on agriculture production, access to health services, a lot of community level interventions for stability. Um, sanitation and hygiene, both from behavioral and structural kind of perspectives, and really understanding the local causes of malnutrition. And, and so that also speaks to intra-household inequality, um, issues around gender and youth. So by, in our development and emergency activities, you know, kind of addressing all these, all these aspects of food insecurity to help build resilience in communities to, for preventing, for especially when there's in, in areas where there's recurrent crises. 
And so kind of around the office, one of the common phrases is an, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So is that kind of, a, that kind of a, an approach. So this is probably not very legible, and that's OK, because it's a conceptual framework, which is available anywhere you can find it. Um, but this is, the kind of, this is the way that Food for Peace perceives our involvement in kind of more global, the, the global movement towards uh, nutrition, secu nutrition security, addressing nutrition security. So this concept of nutrition security in, in, our, in Food for Peace's goals deliberately signals the importance of a wide range of nutrition, sanitation, health, and social factors and addressing these underlying causes while trying to achieve while contributing to nutrition security globally. So you can kind of, you can kind of see, if you, if you can read that from, from where you are, I imagine it's probably a little bit difficult. But the, the approach is really moving from kind of some, fundament, some fundamental causes of food, of food insecurity, moving through both individual and household levels and community levels up into higher level outcomes that really focus on availability, access, and utilization of food. And then, with, of course, with the overall goal of food and nutrition security. So our programming works in, a, it's just in, very inherently holistic and multi-sectoral, both in the, in the emergency, but especially in the development activities that we fund. And so we embrace these kind of cross, um, so we kind of work across all different sectors of ag and health and nutrition and WASH and always with these cross-cutting issues addressing gender, youth, and environment. And so everyone today is going to talk a little bit about different ways that we use evidence. Some of the kind of at the office level, some of the things that we do, we support research with academics and with kind of other research initiatives and engage to try to stay up to date on all the latest. Um, our technical, like I said before, our technical teams work in support of the geo our geographic, our geo colleagues to do this. So we're kind of these advisory roles. Um, so we engage with academic research, our partners do research and assessments that we also, that we engage with but also learn from as well. Food for Peace funds FuseNet, the Famine Early Warning System Network. Um, we also do baseline and endline evaluations for our emergency programs that are a little bit more long term, but our development programs all do them as well. And we conduct regular monitoring, both Food for Peace and our partners do it. And when, we, when, we're, working, when we're operating in areas where we can't, we, we use third party monitoring as well, where, where we have like, limited access. Um, to be to have eyes on the ground, so that's kind of kind of at the office level, kind of some of the formal ways that we engage with research and different ways of learning and gathering evidence for these different sectors. So I'm going to pass off the presentation now to Mike, who's going to talk about how in the field of nutrition we use the evidence. Okay. Does everybody hear me okay? All right, great. I'm, I'm using the doohickey. <laughs> I believe that's the technical term. Yeah, so as Hillary mentioned, and just because we have uh, health students here, I, I have an MPH, and somehow um, I ended up working in USAID, Office of Food for Peace, but I work on nutrition programming as a nutrition advisor, but we also do cover general public health programming, maternal and, and uh, including maternal and child health. But um, our program objectives, especially on the development side, and I'm going to talk mainly about what we do in development programming. I think that's going to be a general theme uh, for the rest of the session here. Um, our objectives really do focus on reducing uh, malnutrition, especially uh, reducing stunting or chronic malnutrition uh, in children under five. And our focus is on the, the, this first thousand days, so from, from pregnancy until the child reaches about the, uh, until the child reaches the age of two. Um, we focus a lot in our programs on community, um, maternal child health and nutrition. 
Um, and just to summarize a little bit about what some of our interventions look like, I have, um, I have here, and then I'm referring a little bit to the, to the levels of evidence we have for, for these interventions. And as I continue with the presentation, I'm gonna talk through um, what are we doing to, uh, to, to work with evidence that's already existing, as well as um, uh, develop new evidence in, in terms of um, uh, creating new research and then doing some of our own direct uh, monitoring and evaluating of our, of our programs, which Hillary already mentioned. So some of our interventions um, include, uh, as it relates to our Food for Peace strategy, um, we, we, do, we work to improve uh, local or community systems, uh, so strengthening local institutions, a lot of capacity building. If you were at the previous presentation, I noticed there was a focus on that. Um, to, to, uh, but, but, but really capacity building more geared towards the community level. So we do a lot of work with community volunteers, community health workers, <laughs> Um, community health associations, for example. That doesn't mean that we limit ourselves to, to, uh, to just the community as we, some of our programs do work at facility as well. Um, uh, a big focus of our programs is to foster social and behavior change for nutrition, but uh, in, in recent years we, are, we work uh, more holistically, so we are addressing behavior, um, behavior issues, uh, behavioral determinants across multiple sectors, not just nutrition. I think some of my colleagues may talk about that as well. Um, and one thing that you, you may know us for, and you may think, oh, that's all we do, um, but it's really part of what we do is food assistance in our development programs. I think um, some of you may, may assume that's really a big focus of, of all that we do, but it is just part of a larger basket of, of, of services um, that, that, and, and also um, practices and, and, and other factors that we look at in our long-term programming. So food, food assistance includes the use of preventative rations to prevent malnutrition. There's different products that are used as well as using cash or vouchers. So that's the broader, in, in a very short nutshell, what is food assistance? It's, it's, it's a multitude of things. And Food for Peace has come a long way. And in our development programs, that's just one aspect that we touch on in food assistance is preventing malnutrition. Um, and, the, and, and so the evidence there is still mixed and emerging. I'll talk about that in a moment. And so one last thing I want to mention that I think is extremely important for students that are just maybe learning about nutrition and, and global nutrition is um, there is more emerging evidence on uh, what are deemed nutrition sensitive programming. So I'm just listing a few here, gardening, for nutrition, food safety, hygiene, family planning, uh, youth literacy, um, and, and we, we touch upon a lot of these factors. Uh, and just to go with the theme of illegible conceptual frameworks, here's one that if I, were a, if I were a student, I would really want to get to know a little bit. So this comes from um, an extremely important publication called uh, the Lancet Nutrition Series that came out in 2013. Um, and what it did is it broke down what are the different interventions. So on the left, we have what are called nutrition-specific interventions that address these immediate determinants of malnutrition, where we have a lot of good evidence to say that these are effective. However, in the, in the, when I remember I discussed our program's focus on stunting chronic malnutrition, there's a lot on the side of what's called nutrition sensitive, which are the more distal determinants of malnutrition, which my colleagues will talk about. Uh, one of those areas is WASH, and there is much more evidence that is emerging. I think um, uh, Nicole will be talking about that. And again, a plug for, for this work, which to me is just extremely important. If you want to look it up, I did not provide the link, but it is available online. The, 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 these papers that came out in 2013, even though it's five years ago, there, there may be an update now uh, coming in, in, the, in the next year or two, as I understand. Um, 
And so just to show an example of what we've done, we, we did um, through a, a, our, our partner called Fanta Project, um, they, they did a uh, randomized controlled trial to, to look at different um, types of co food components linked with health, health service delivery and behavior change to examine the, the, the evidence of what was the most effective approach. So this study was done in Guatemala. Um, I'm really not gonna go into great detail, but it, it showed how the, the, really the most effective approach was to provide not just a food supplement, but also uh, an additional uh, ration of food that went to, to, to the household. And this is to prevent stunting in children six to 23. Uh, they're looking at children uh, six to 23 months in particular. But the study also looked at many other outcomes. So I'm just highlighting one factor here. Um, and so that helps us determine policy and where we want to move with our programs. Um, again, it's just touching on an example. So uh, finally, I have a, um, I just want to check how I'm doing on time. Oh, excellent. Wow. I'm amazed. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so finally, finally oh, I, I could, could be, be looking, looking at this the whole time. time. Um, I participated in a midterm evaluation, I believe, last year of uh, two of our programs in Malawi. Um, and what's really interesting uh, about this evaluation is that um, I participated as uh, someone that was collecting data for the evaluation itself. And it was very much a partnership with external consultants as well as implementing partners. And collectively, I think we, we were able to have. Uh, much stronger um, uh, recommendations for the project. And one of the things I looked at is something that's very common in our programs, which is group and individual nutrition education. Um, and this just gives an example of some of the things we looked at. I think one of the findings I'll just highlight from the first picture in your upper right is that we, you know, we have, we, you've probably seen this in the field or you've heard about this. There's a lot of the use of these these types of flip charts so which has been going on for many years to promote different messages to communicate optimal practices related to nutrition so as you can see in this picture however you have a very mixed audience so uh, a, a very young uh, woman and ad potentially an adolescent with, with a, a, a bit older and and but these materials were not necessarily adapted for these different age groups so that was just an example of one finding among many others um, and so uh, this is my last slide uh, just to show an example of Something we do in our programs, which is, this is an area that's relatively new, but cuts across um, the, the, the whole resilience agenda. So it, how, how many of you are familiar with CMAM, Community Management of Acute Malnutrition? Okay, there's a few hands, that's great. So this is a CMAM surge uh, project that was uh, developed in, in, in Northern Uganda within our programs. And this is, a, a, it's actually a health system strengthening model. It's a, a, which um, we found to be quite interesting for a longer term program to, to, to get health facilities and, um, and, and local health actors to, to adapt to um, spikes in acute malnutrition throughout the year. So uh, just a, again, an example, but it's an area where we also wanna have greater evidence, um, but is a promising area being piloted in, in West Africa and East Africa. And now I'm gonna introduce my colleague, uh, Nicole, and she's gonna talk about WASH. Hello, um, so I'm Nicole and I am a WASH advisor at Food for Peace. As mentioned, my background is in engineering and microbiology, so I'm gonna get very excited talking about pathogens, which you'll see later. Um, so WASH and Food for Peace has the goal to intercept fecal oral pathways. Um, this is basically stopping feces from getting into one's mouth. Uh, this is done through drinking water interventions, including boreholes, but we also do productive water in Food for Peace. Um, we have sanitation interventions, such as community-led total sanitation, and hygiene interventions, such as behavior change campaigns on proper hand washing. 
Um, when reviewing our WASH program, programming, as the Food for Peace WASH team does, we like to look at evidence. And so we often go to the literature and look at peer-reviewed journal articles. So as such, I would like to start by briefing, briefly framing the recently released results from two large WASH studies, which some of you may be familiar with, called WASH Benefits and Shine. And I would like to discuss the results of these multi-year studies, which had some surprising and unexpected results. Um, in addition, I'll describe some other important WASH research studies and why they are important for WASH programming. So WASH Benefits and Shine were three randomized control trials done in Bangladesh, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. They aimed to investigate whether WASH and nutrition combined and independently had an impact on diarrhea and or stunting. Um, the results of these studies found that there was a small improvement in linear growth from nutrition and nutrition plus WASH interventions with no added benefit from WASH. Uh, in Bangladesh, there was uh, an observed reduction in diarrhea in all arms of the study, except for the water-only arm, while in Kenya and Zimbabwe, none of the inter interventions resulted in a reduction of diarrhea. So these results were quite unexpected because I think everyone thought that we were going to see uh, reductions in um, WASH outcomes. Um, so these surprising results required reflection and some key considerations must be discussed including that all interventions were not at the community level. Instead, uh, they were provided at the household level to pregnant and lactating women. Uh, there was no drinking water intervention per se. Instead, this was a hygiene intervention where they were using point of use drinking water treatment at, um, in the household. Um, and this method is proved to be ineffective against two pathogens, including cryptosporidium and giardia, which were both later found to be identified in the areas near and around Kenya where the study was done. Um, finally, adherence uptake and intervention intensity were hugely important as Bangladesh saw a reduction in diarrhea even though they started with really low levels, but they also had 75% adherence to all of the interventions and significant follow-up with six visits per month for two years for the women. Um, so as a result of this important body of work, Food for Peace drafted five key takeaways for our geographical team colleagues for um, looking at when evaluating Food for Peace WASH programs. And these are the five that are listed on the slide, which is to encourage holistic community level WASH programming, to take a rational approach to targeting all primary fecal oral disease pathways, including animal feces, um, where appropriate, include sustainable drinking water interventions, um, evaluate the intensity and efficacy of behavior change interventions, and consider how to reduce barriers to behavior change. Um, so, next, uh, we were talking about community uh, programming of WASH. So one result from the WASH nutrition research was the need to move beyond household level sanitation to community level sanitation, such as CLTS. This is also backed up by research in rural Mali of a randomized control trial, as well as a meta-analysis that aimed to understand the impact of community-led sanitation on children's health. The results found that for the RCT, children in CLTS villages were less likely to be stunted than those in non-CLTS villages. And for the meta-analysis, community latrine coverage was positively associated with children's height and weight in that every 10% increase in latrine coverage was associated with a 0.031 increase in child's height for HZ score. This is important because to date, little information has been published on the health benefits of community level sanitation and implementation of this methodology is done worldwide. Um, other research is um, entitled Sani Path, which uh, was done by Emory University. And it points to other exposure pathways of concern for children aged two to five years. Um, research there that was done in Ghana had the aim of quantifying exposure and with pathways have the greatest contribution by observing behaviors, taking environmental samples, and performing household level surveys. The results found like, that the food pathway dominates and also that the soil pathway is important. <laughs> this is important for our programming because most WASH packages do not target food or soil, so we should take a rational approach to designing appropriate WASH interventions that intercept all fecal oral pathways of concern to reduce exposure to pathogens and ultimately to reduce outcomes like diarrhea and stunting. Finally, the most exciting part, there are two major research studies to identify the key pathogens of concern. Um, the first one is called the Global Enteric Multicenter Study, or GEMS, and the other is the Malnutrition and Enteric Disease, or MALED study. 
This research had the aim of understanding the burden and etiology of diarrhea and enteric infections in children and was done by collecting and analyzing the stool of numerous children for pathogens. Data was collected from numerous countries in Africa, Asia, and South America. The results of this work found that for GEMS, the six mo most important pathogens were Shigella, rotavirus, adenovirus, heat-stable enterotoxin-producing E. coli, or STE-TEC, cryptosporidium, and campylobacter. For maled, it was found that campylobacter is prevalent across a diverse range of settings and may be associated with growth shortfalls. This work is important because some of the main pathogens identified also have implications for the type of WASH interventions that are implemented. For example, point of use chlorine treatment of, a household level of household drinking water is ineffective against cryptosporidium, which is one of the six most important pathogens for diarrhea and enteric infection in children. Um, this work is also important because Campylobacter has been potentially identified as a main cause of environmental enteric dysfunction, or EED which has been hypothesized to lead to issues with the gut that can reduce absorption of nutrients and result in stunting. Moreover, Campylobacter is found in bird feces like chickens, and this is an important fecal oral pathway for children in many countries. Um, ultimately, all of this research has demonstrated the complexities of the WASH programming in Food for Peace, and uh, for everyone, actually, and how um, each context must be evaluated. Ultimately, the same bag of wash tricks can't be used in every situation, but should be tailored to fit each country, region, different district, and community-specific needs. Oh, next up is Charlie. I'm sorry, I forgot my next job. Who is our agriculture advisor in Food for Peace? Uh, thank you, Nicole. Um, so yeah, I'm Charlie Davis. I'm uh, an agriculture advisor with the technical team, um, but I'm also uh, in the Foreign Service, and so I'm kind of doing a stint with the team here in Washington. Um, but I've mostly been overseas, uh, kind of overseeing the implementation of, of uh, not Food for Peace activities, more kind of um, Bureau for Food Security funded activities through the Feed the Future initiative. Um, but uh, so um, my uh, my kind of section of this presentation was just going to kind of walk through a little bit of what Food for Peace does in terms of uh, agriculture activities. And a lot of it is can somewhat be reflected uh, throughout, I think, a lot of USAID programs. Um, you, Food for Peace particularly focuses way more on um, on uh, the most vulnerable households and definitely focuses more at the household level as opposed to policy change or um, kind of higher, uh, higher levels of the value chain, uh, like working with processing and things like that, that would be more um, other parts of USA that would focus on that. Um, but um, first of all, I just wanted to kind of uh, talk a little bit about like why, Mike, Mike mentioned it, uh, but why do we do, ag when we're talking about nutrition, why do we do agriculture? And um, I mean, it's somewhat, it seems somewhat obvious, uh, maybe because you have to grow food to be able to eat it. Um, but uh, there's actually um, kind of with, within the literature and within our programming, I think there's kind of three main pathways that we look at for when focusing on agricultural activities. How are we affecting nutrition, um, kind of those higher level nutrition goals, stunting, wasting. Um, and, uh, and I mean, the first one is that uh, kind of more production equals more consumption. A lot of the, uh, the areas we're working in, a lot of the farmers and households we're working with are, are subsistence. Um, so the theory is that you can help farmers produce more at the household level, they'll, they'll eat more. And, uh, and there is some also research kind of looking at as you diversify uh, production at the household level, how does that affect diverse diets and can you, uh, and also, you know, that includes livestock as well, looking at how does uh, working with livestock specifically and animal sourced foods affect nutrition. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, the other one is obviously, uh, if your main livelihood is agriculture, you're, um, there also is a good chance that you're selling some of your production, so um, increasing incomes, and then that's gonna allow you to be able to purchase uh, a wider variety of food and be more more stable in uh, the types of food that you're eating. And then also women's empowerment is uh, another key aspect of a lot of the livelihoods work that we do. Um, and uh, women as 
uh, kind of decision makers for the family, uh, decision makers around what the household's eating, uh, particularly children, and, um, and how that affects nutrition. So those are kind of like the three main causal linkages, pathways that you see uh, in the literature. And uh, I think Mike pointed a little bit to some of the, some of the actual research that backs some of these theories up. And uh, it is, uh, we actually, one of the uh, grants that Feed Food for Peace funds is the Food Aid Consultative Group, uh, right? Um, and they do, it's through Tufts University, um, and they do research, um, and also um, they, they do a, a big conference every year. And this year, they actually, one of the conference uh, presenters was talking about what is the actual evidence base for nutrition sensitive agriculture and agriculture uh, impact on nutrition. And uh, I think her conclusion was essentially there's very little um, evidence to back it up, um, which I think is it's developing. I think there is um, it's very context and country specific. Um, I mean, you, people point to um, livestock uh, in particular as having sometimes a mixed effect if you work with um, uh, like there's there's a study I believe from Uganda where uh, a project was working to promote um, cattle and uh, and that actually was seen to have a negative impact on wash which then had a negative impact on nutrition um, whereas working with goats and sheep smaller ruminants actually was more positive and didn't have the same effect on wash uh, or, or hygiene issues um, so um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's there's definitely more to be learned in that in in this field. Um, but uh, for uh, food for peace, um, our activities tend to focus a lot on farmer training, um, and that includes kind of throughout the throughout the cycle. Um, so from seed procurement, seed seed production, uh, fertilizer production and distribution to uh, you know ac actual planting and and uh, and then post harvest handling practices and then to some extent we we also work at other parts uh, of the value chain around uh, like higher level processing and trying to um, affect that what what's kind of like the push pull of the market um, so creating a a better market system um, for vulnerable farmers to to be involved in um, in in their their national agricultural system because um, a lot of times the the places that we're working um, farmers and the communities are extremely isolated and so they um, even though um, there may be a national market for things um, they're so far removed especially during like rainy season when roads might be washed out um, that they're not actually able to access uh, markets um, so that's where we actually do do things like uh, feeder roads and market roads um, and and more um, kind of small-scale infrastructure uh, projects as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, an I mean, another key activity, um, and sorry, this, my slides don't actually match my presentation very well. I sent in the slides before I knew what I was going to say. So, uh, But um, this is more just to give you a little bit of some, something to look at while I'm talking. Um, so this is, a, this is obviously a very um, depleted soil. Um, so this is kind of typical of a lot of the, uh, the areas that we work. Um, they're ravaged by drought or floods or both, um, usually starting from a very low base of in terms of natural resources. Um, farmers working on marginal land. So a lot of our activities uh, end up focusing on um, soil fertility improvements, uh, water, better water efficiency for crops, um, in increasing uh, kind of uh, the, the supply and availability of uh, drought tolerant and heat tolerant seeds. Um, those are kind of some of the, just, just an example of some of the activities that we, that we work on through our programs. Um, and uh, and then we we also do uh, quite a bit with kind of reforestation and community uh, watershed management. So looking at those community resources that may not belong to an individual household, um, but may be managed by uh, a community group, a water user association, um, or um, I mean, in some cases, we're actually helping to establish uh, like forest management committees. Um, and uh, a lot of that has to 
has an impact on soil erosion. Um, it's also, uh, you know, there's research to show that actually forests serve as a source of resilience for communities that are hit by natural shocks. Um, so um, another, another, another activity that we work on that um, targets those, those vulnerable populations. Um, and okay, thanks. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I was in a presentation earlier where they were talking a lot about uh, resilience and how resilience has become uh, kind of a buzzword in the agency. There's a resilience uh, policy and, uh, and it's a big drive of the, the, the new administrator as well. And Food for Peace, uh, definitely with its agriculture, but all of, all of its programming is really uh, is at the kind of epicenter of that uh, resilience effort. It's a very integrated approach. It's not just one, uh, one part of a community that we're looking at to address uh, the most vulnerable populations. It's, um, it's uh, the entire uh, kind of suite of, active, of things that affect uh, vulnerable households and, and malnutrition. Um, and I think uh, the, I mean, w as a humanitarian and development uh, office, we, we actually kind of straddle that development humanitarian nexus more than any, almost any other office within uh, Food for Peace. And so, um, I mean, a, a big part of our work is to try and um, look at where are the, where are the humanitarian needs and how do we look at what the causes of, of those increases in humanitarian assistance are and try, and try and create programs that will make the communities more resilient to the next shock and assume that there will be another shock. Uh, it's not, um, this, these are not one-off events, uh, which most of the places we work, they experience drought or floods on a, on a very regular basis. Um, and um, so, um, Okay, and uh, so, yeah, I think um, I've gone through a little bit, some of the activities that we work on, um, some of the, uh, the research that's out there, um, and I think um, it's, we're still looking at ways to better measure um, the effect of livelihoods programming on nutrition and, um, and agriculture assistance uh, to improve nutrition. Um, but there, I mean, there's definitely, as I kind of started with, there's some very clear theoretical links. I think the, the challenge continues to be actually measuring where does a specific program impact uh, those high level outcome um, nutrition indicators that we're focusing on with our, with our emergency and development assistance. Um, so uh, more to come, I think. And, uh, and then I assume these, I also just put some um, some links to resources for uh, those of you who might be new to, to the field. Um, I think there's a lot that USAID writ large is funding in terms of research. Um, AgriLinks is a great uh, website that has uh, a ton of uh, resources on what USAID is doing to better understand um, how agriculture affects nutrition. Um, there's the Food Security and Nutrition Network. Uh, and, and many other resources, actually. Um, so it's a, it's a big topic, uh, and this is just a really quick uh, introduction and overview. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully we can kind of get into a discussion as well uh, after I hand it over to Jenny Baca, who's going to talk about um, gender and youth, correct? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Is this good? Can you hear me um, in the recording and everything? So how's everyone doing? Still awake, still doing well. This is good. Um, so I'm Jenny Baca. I, my background is in human geography, and it's been a really fun transition to take some of that expertise and apply it at Food for Peace and trying to think through intersections between social inequalities and the way we use the environment, social inequalities and access to food, social inequalities and the ability to make full nutritious utilization of, for, uh, of food resources. Um, so today, like all of my colleagues here, we've had to consolidate a lot of our thinking and a lot of our experiences and a lot of the work that is out there in our technical fields into a very small little piece. And I may have pitched this at 
too general of a level, but just bear with me here. Um, I'm going to talk about two different things. The first thing, I just want to talk about why do we even think about gender when we're talking about food security? I think this is a really important question to ask and to sort of step back and work through in a concrete way. Um, and the second thing I'm going to talk about is a gender consultation workshop that we run with our implementing partners in the startup year of their five-year development food security activities. So this gender consultation workshop, which we do in the country where this development food security activity is going to take place, it's one of the main ways that evidence around gender and food security or gender and food insecurity influences our Food for Peace programming. So part one, um, what does gender mean in the context of Food for Peace? When we talk about gender, we are not just talking about the inclusion of women in our programming. Uh, we are talking about the social meanings that adhere to maleness or femaleness. We are talking about gender as a system of social expectations of the proper roles and responsibilities for men and women, for girls and boys. These proper roles often bring different opportunities, they bring different limitations, they bring different types of knowledge, and they bring different forms of power. At Food for Peace, we're interested in understanding how can gender cause inequalities between men and women, girls and boys. Um, and these types of inequalities are obviously infinite. But some of the key areas that illuminate how gender plays a role in food security or food insecurity uh, include differences in access to resources, um, assets, services, differences in how men and women spend their time. This is something that we think about, well, what's the balance in how men and women spend the time and what's the balance between uh, paid employment, un unpaid subsistence and care work and volunteer activities? A, a third key area of inequalities is differences in access to leadership and decision-making power. So this slide up here shows how some of these gender inequalities that I've just mentioned can really affect the multiple dimensions of food security. So I don't know if people are familiar with the different pillars of food security. Uh, they talk about food availability, food access, food utilization, and now, I don't know, I guess in the last four or five years, maybe longer than that, food um, stability or the stability of your access to food. Um, this one walks us through just the first three pillars. So because women in many of the places where we work, and particularly with the populations that we work with, um, most women have less access to and control over resources like land and capital, their agricultural produ production tends to result in lower yields or less diverse yields or yields of lower quality. This isn't anything inherent to women's ability to farm. This has to do with the social context and uh, characteristics of their ability to own and access land, to own and access uh, inputs like higher yielding seeds, things like that. So this lower access to land or this lower access to inputs into agricultural production often results in lower overall food av availability because women farmers are not able to produce as well. Okay, so for a second one, uh, women earn, generally earn lower wages than men. They often have less access to paid labor, sorry for the puh, paid labor than men. Um, and because of women's triple burden, so the triple burden is this phrase that we use to talk about how women have this triple role of providing reproductive labor, that's subsistence and care work, uh, productive labor, which is paid income generating work, and social labor, which may be volunteer work around the level of the community. Because of this triple burden, women often have less men to even less time than men uh, to to work in paid labor. This lower level of income for women often means they have lower access to buying food on the market. Okay, the final piece here is how social expectations of women's roles often limits women's control over their time. And again, I'm going to repeat this phrase of the triple burden, reproductive, productive, and social labor. Um, this means that women often do not have enough time to fulfill all their responsibilities related to food preparation or young child feeding. And the final result of this is 
poor food utilization or poor nutritional levels. So here I want to reference back up to some of the things that Mike Mansky said and, and just saying how important it is to recognize that Okay, sorry, step back. I want to reiterate how recognizing women's time burden is crucial to our understanding of some of the causes of suboptimal feeding practices. So women in a lot of the places where Food for Peace uh, operates and works, they already have extensive knowledge of what proper nutritional practices are. Um, many of them are quite aware of the preference for exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life. But this triple burden role often makes it really hard to follow these ideal practices. So through sort of contextual analysis of where we work, we try to, under, to understand or identify if it's this lack of time that's contributing to these poor nutritional practices rather than assuming straight up that it's a lack of knowledge. Okay, so we've been talking about gender norms mainly for women. Um, however, gender norms around men and masculinity can also have large impacts on nutritional and food security outcomes. So for example, if we're working in an area where a man might be teased or stigmatized for taking on some of the child care or the food production labor, um, this is going to have repercussions for food and nutritional security within his household. Okay, so we have this which is, oh my goodness, which is, I'm speaking too slowly. Um, so that's an illustration of gender, how gender can affect the three dimensions of food security. Uh, the last piece I'm going to talk about is the gender consultation workshop that we at Food for Peace conduct um, with our implementing partners in the beginning of their five-year development food security activity. And this is meant to be an example of how evidence informs our programming. So uh, the way this works is our implementing partners, each of them uh, send about an eight-person team to attend the wor workshop. And over the course of three days, we work through key findings on gender dynamics and food security. And we put these findings in conversation with our implementing partners' knowledge of the context where they work and the plans that they have for programming. So we start by reviewing how gender norms might affect the dimensions of food security more broadly, and then we'll dig into how gender norms might influence each of the sectors that Food for Peace does in its multi-sectoral programming. So what's the evidence on gender and maternal child health and nutrition, gender in WASH, gender in agriculture and livelihoods, gender in disaster risk reduction and resilience? It's a lot of material. Um, so what you see here, which is following in our theme of hard to read graphics, um, what you see up here is an infographic from the gender and agriculture and livelihoods bundle that we end up using in our workshop. It presents the findings of an Oxfam study, and you can kind of see a little book on the top left that's referencing that study. Um, it, prevents the it presents the findings of this Oxfam study on the benefits of women's participation in agricultural collectives, the factors that make this kind of collective work successful, as well as key challenges that prevent women from participating in something like this. It also shows that gender-blind programming on forming agricultural collectives would likely lead to the exclusion of women. So in the course of the workshop, the implementing partners will engage with each sectoral bundle of infographics. So we have a lot of these. Um, and they process the findings of those infographics with their team, and they put them into conversation with their project plans. Using this evidence presented in the infographics to think through their projects ends up helping implementing partners identify what they know, what they don't know, what they need to investigate further in the context of their own programming, how they might modify their thinking about some of the causes of food security in the specific places where they work, or how they might modify some of the activities that they've planned to address this. So I'm going to draw this to a conclusion and just say the gender consultation workshop and this infographic are just one small example of how um, evidence about gender and food security ends up influencing our uh, programming. Thank you. OK, we wanted to make sure to leave time for question and answer. So I think we have to run microphones around. So maybe start waving now if there's any questions. Hi, Jim Tills from GW here. Um, I'm delighted to hear uh, 
the admission that in fact the causal links between nutrition interventions ag-oriented ag nutrition interventions and actual nutritional outcomes in the MCH uh, is uh, a sparse evidence base. I mean, many of us have been talking about this for 30 years. And I'd like to hear, because of that, what AID is doing to solve the evidence gap here? What research are you guys investing in? And if you're not investing in it, why not? Since you're making lots of assumptions going forward with many of your programs, and in fact, it's true. And in fact, you know, there's lots of stuff that should be true that turns out not to work. Um, so, you know, that evidence generation piece is really important. I'd like to hear what you guys are planning on doing about that. Assuming I have to respond to that. There we go. Um, so... I agree that this, it's really important, and um, we should be doing more to fund research. I, uh, we have to be careful, I think, because we're, we're on camera, but um, <laughs> um, I, within Food for Peace, we are uh, obviously humanitarian um, part of USAID, so our ability to fund a lot of research is somewhat limited, I would say, um, but the more of the funding, I would say, goes through the kind of Bureau for Food Security, which does have a, a learning um, agenda um, and kind of the the nutrition nutrition agriculture link. Uh, I believe is part of that, um, and we do have these. I mean, one of the many resources I put up there was a link to the the different. Um, innovation labs um, where we fund a lot of research with with different um, universities mostly land-grant universities um, but that's obviously a, it's not all focused around nutrition a lot of it is around uh, improving productivity and um, maybe reducing post-harvest losses um, yeah I think uh, I think it's a good uh, challenge and a good um, question to to USAID writ large um, I am not able to speak uh, very informatively on where where we're going in terms of that research funding, um, but I do think it's an area that needs more more research. I would agree. I, I just want to quickly mention that um, over the last maybe three or four years or so, the the Spring Project uh, was looking into this, um, uh, in, in in particular nutrition-sensitive agriculture pathways for, for better nutrition. So looking at income, looking at uh, agriculture production, how they may, that may lead to better nutrition, as well as, uh, I, I'm, I think, uh, women's empowerment. And now there is a new iteration, uh, a new project that was recently awarded that I think is going to be doing quite a bit more on, on generating evidence. Um, yes. And then right after you, we have, so if you can just pass the microphone. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, I am Mark Mpasa, uh, originally from Malawi. I'm here at GW studying global health. Uh, my question, I think, has to do with you of what you presented. You presented about uh, the Obari project, which uh, USAID is implementing in Malawi. Um, specifically, I want to know, like, what what are uh, like safeguards that uh, USAID has put in place in order to reduce the undesirable effects that the project that you are implementing in the communities uh, uh, are coming up with? I'm talking about this because uh, I think two years ago I was involved in a, a certain project uh, which was about long-term effect uh, forms of uh, contraceptives. So we found out that most women were dropping from uh, these programs of getting uh, contraceptives because they wanted to be pregnant and also to have kids because they, once that have kids of less than two years, they were getting assistance from the Ubali project getting food. So those who don't have kids, they were not getting the assistance. So my question is coming from that, um, from that experience, like, uh, because that's, I can take that as an undesirable effect that it has in the community. We found that we are trying, uh, like, to uh, reduce population growth and things like that, but because of this, we found that women were dropping out from, from contraceptives. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to answer that. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I, I mentioned is that our programs do try to integrate um, maternal and child health programming, including family planning. And we in Malawi, we actually uh, funded a partner to look at how could um, one of the pro how could the projects actually strengthen uh, family planning programming, um, and that's uh, I'll get again our 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 partner Fanta project, and you can find some of that online. But you know we we take that very seriously. Uh, one thing that we when we do look into these some of these instances where there are reports of reduction in contraceptive use or reduction and uptake of family planning services um, we we do we we have looked at or at least partners have looked at this and found that the reports are coming because programming is also uh, is also encouraging uh, uh, greater use of ANC services and so data greater data is being generated in it and so in some cases we're, um, we found that even though there are reports of more pregnancies, it's there's also more women coming to health facilities as a result of the program. But I would like to talk with you maybe after the discussion and follow up with you more. So that's a great point. We have a, another question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tessa. I'm with Special Olympics International. Um, so you mentioned multiple times that you're trying to target the most vulnerable populations, but I'm curious to know if you're adapting any of your training resources to reach people with intellectual disabilities. Hi, I think I think I'll take that one. I guess. Um, yeah, one of the. <laughs> It's kind of a hard question to respond to. I know that um, speaking for Food for Peace is different than speaking about USAID more generally. Um, and I am on the gender and youth team, and we're also, we should be the team that starts looking at and thinking more about people with different abilities and the way our programmings can be adapted to that. Um, the way we provide technical feedback to our implementing partners is through knowledge about what are the types of um, literacy rates and access to, uh, access to education and things like that, because most of the places that we are working, there is low or, or no literacy. And so much of our feedback is trying to um, work with implementing partners to identify how can you provide different types of information that actually is accessible to those populations. But the specific question that you're asking about people with learning disabilities or other forms of disabilities, I think that's something that's on our, our future is to try to bring a more inter inter intersectional approach to the way Food for Peace is thinking about gender, age, ethnicity, race, uh, ability, and things like that. And that approach is definitely present already in different parts of USAID, but it has to do with figuring out how we can operationalize that in Food for Peace's programming. But thank you so much for the question. Any more questions? People are just pondering and thinking through the, the presentations. <laughs> Thank you. Hillary, I leave it to you. No, I mean, I guess I think our time is up anyway, so thank you all. Um, yeah, thank you for, for joining us. Feel thank free to you. talk to us afterwards. <laughs>